me begin today with another edition of Brian's Bad Jokes. I just have one short one for you. It was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and a man was frantically beating on the door of a butcher shop. Finally, the butcher opened the door, and the man said, Look, I know you're closed, but I forgot to buy a Thanksgiving turkey. My wife is going to kill me. Do you have anything left in the back? Well, the butcher said he didn't think he had anything, but he invited the man in, and the butcher went to the back. I found one scrawny little bird in his freezer. He brought it out to the man and showed it to him, and the man said, No, that, that's much too small. Do you have anything else? Which guy kind of shook his head, but he still went back to check. But then he had an idea. He banged a couple pots around. He made some scuffling sounds. He sat there for a minute. And then he brought the same bird out and said, Well, I looked around and way back in the freezer I found this bird. And the man said, No, that's still too small. You better give me both of them. <laughs> this weekend we celebrated Thanksgiving. And we are continuing our look at the Minor Prophets. Today we begin the book of Haggai. And so today I want to look at what it means to be thankful. Haggai was the first post-exile prophet. All the prophets we've looked at so far have been pre-exile prophets. That is, the other prophets warned the people of a coming disaster. The prophets said that the people had turned away from God, and if they did not turn back, then God would raise up an army to destroy them. And the people did not turn back to the Lord, and God did raise up the Babylonian army. The Babylonians invaded, the nation was destroyed, the temple was demolished, and the people were sent as slaves in exile. That happened. But then... God brought the people back to their homeland. He ended the exile. Haggai was the first prophet who delivered the word of the Lord after the exile ended. And this was a time of mixed emotions for the Israelites. On the one hand, there was a lot to do. The reality of living in a ruined nation had sunk in. Their homes had been destroyed. Their Farmland was now forests. Their cities were ghost towns. Their greatest monuments were in shambles. The task before the Israelites, the task of rebuilding a ruined nation was beyond Herculean. On the other hand, they were free. They were back in their homeland. God had done something for them that had never been done in the history of the world. Israel had been destroyed in war. For 70 years, there was no nation of Israel. And then God brought them back. He made them into a nation again. That had never happened in human history up to this point. Despite all their challenges, they had a lot to be thankful for. God had restored them. He had brought them home. They would live in their own homes. They would work their own fields. They would worship their God. For all the anxiety they faced, they had a lot of reasons to give thanks. And I can't help but draw a connection between Israel in the 4th century B.C. and America in 2020 A.D. There's one thing basically every American agrees on is that this has been a tough year. I mentioned a few weeks ago that happiness in America is at an all-time low. Depression is at the highest level it has been since we started keeping track of these things. And I generally agree that this all goes back to the pandemic we are facing. And while that is true, it's also a little more complicated. The pandemic is the root cause here, but how that pandemic translates into happiness is more complex. Because it's not simply that the pandemic makes us unhappy, it makes us anxious. It fills us with lots of uncertainty, lots of things we just don't know. How long will this last? What's going to happen? Who's going to get this disease? We now have word of a vaccine, and in an odd twist, that has increased anxiety, because it's increased the number of unknowns. 
How effective will that vaccine be? When will it get here? How will it be, how will it be administered? And these unknowns, this uncertainty creates anxiety in our lives. And anxiety just wears us out. More than half of Americans say that compared to this time last year, they are just emotionally exhausted. All these unknowns create this anxiety. It's like running a race without a set finish line or trying to put together a puzzle where we don't see the picture of the box and somebody stole the four corner pieces. It exhausts us and it's bad for us. So what do we do? How do we deal with this anxiety? How do the Israelites in Haggai's day deal with the anxiety of rebuilding their nation? But for Haggai, the answer in both cases is thankfulness. Modern science has confirmed what the Bible has always taught. An attitude of thankfulness, of gratitude to God, counters anxiety. As one psychologist put it, think of your mental health like a digestive system. What you put into it affects how you feel. If you are flowing with doubt and uncertainty and self-criticism, that, that is going to affect the way that you feel. It will affect your mental health. A practice of gratitude is like a daily workout and a healthy eating plan for your mind. It creates better mental health. And to put it simply, thankfulness counters anxiety in our lives. There's a lot of ways that it does this. Anxiety focuses on what we do not know. It focuses on the unknown. Thankfulness focuses on what we know that God has done for us. Anxiety comes from the uncertain and the unknown. What we do not know creates this anxiety with us. But thankfulness gets us focused on what we know that God has done for us. You know, I often say that if you have a family that loves you, if you have a job that lets you keep food on the table, and if you've got a God in heaven, you've got a lot to be thankful for. And focusing on these things that we have to be thankful for helps us focus on known quantities, not what is uncertain. I know that my family loves me. I know that no one in my home went to bed hungry last night. I know God's grace. And when we focus on what is known, then it counters the anxiety of what is unknown. Second, anxiety is about what we might lose. Thankfulness is about what God has already given us. Anxiety at its heart is about loss. It's about fear of what we might not have in the future. Thankfulness reminds us of what God has already given us. It gives us a chance to rejoice in the gifts of God, and that joy pushes out the anxiety of this world. And third, and finally, anxiety focuses on the future. Thankfulness reminds us of what God is doing in the present. There's a reason that Jesus told us not to worry about the future. Because we really don't have any control over the future until, we get, until it gets here. So there are things we can do to prepare for the future. But it's ultimately beyond our control. And no matter what we feel about the future, it's not going to change the rate at which it comes at us. And we are focused on the future. It creates anxiety. But when we focus on the present, when we are thankful for what God is doing in our lives right now, that counters the anxiety that we feel. Thankfulness, gratitude to God, counters anxiety. However, maybe you're sitting there right now thinking, well, okay, but I've been thankful and I'm still feeling anxious. I mean, maybe you've Tried to be thankful. It was just Thanksgiving. We spend Thanksgiving week in giving thanks to God. And you, you were thankful. And you went around the table on Thanksgiving evening. And everybody said something they were thankful for. And yet, you still feel this anxiety. 
I think the Israelites would have said that's where they were. The Israelites would have said, we are thankful. We gave thanks to God. They wrote a few psalms about how thankful they were. They thanked God, and yet they still felt anxious. You've heard the old joke about a new angel who was giving a who was given a tour of the office buildings of heaven. And the tour guide brought him around to the first room, and it was just packed with action. There were angels running all over the place. Dozens were at work. They had big stacks of paper, constant work coming in. The new angel said, what room is this? The tour guide said, well, this is where we process prayer requests. Hey. The tour guide then took them to the next room, and this room just had one angel in it, kicked back, feet up on the desk, relaxing, Every once in a while, a single letter would drop in, and he'd lazily look over it. And the new angel said, well, what room is this? The new guy said, this is where we process the thank yous. The Israelites would have said, that's not us. We gave thanks to God, yet we are still anxious. So maybe thankfulness doesn't counter anxiety. Now, the thing for Haggai, the problem was not that thankfulness doesn't counter anxiety. The problem was the form in which the Israelites' thankfulness took. And that is, they had a thankfulness of words. They said that they were thankful to God, but that was not reflected in how they lived. By the time Haggai started prophesying, the Israelites had been in their promised land for about 20 years. And yet the temple of the Lord remained in shambles. After an initial burst of energy in repairing the temple, the difficulty of rebuilding the nation set in. And the Israelites went back to work on their own homes. They replowed their own fields. They started new businesses and opened new restaurants, revitalized downtown. And they left the temple of the Lord in ruin. Haggai said, you talk about being thankful, but you go build your own house and leave God's house in ruins. You say that you're thankful, but we don't see that in how you live. If you're thankful to God for giving you your home, go build his home. And so Haggai said, you are missing out on the blessing of God. The people would plant fields, but they never had a big harvest. They would eat and drink, but they never felt full. They would put on clothes, but they were never really warm. What I find interesting about this is that Haggai doesn't really explain why that's happening. As he does not say that this is all a punishment of God for their ingratitude. He does not say that their lack of gratitude created a bad attitude in them, so they were not fully enjoying the gifts of God. And I guess it doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day, the result is the same. The people were not experiencing the blessing of God because they were not living thankful lives. Hey, like I said, if you are genuinely thankful to the Lord, then go into the mountain, get timber, bring it down, build God's house. If you're thankful for your new home, rebuild God's home. Don't just have a thankfulness of words. Have a thankfulness in your actions. That basic principle still applies today. Too often we have a thankfulness of words. And as they say, talk is cheap. It's easy to say that we are thankful. But thankfulness that changes our lives, thankfulness that counters the anxiety of this world, Thankfulness that is seen in actions. If we are really thankful, it will be revealed in our lives. If I am thankful for my family, then we will be able to see that in how I interact with my family. If I am thankful for my kids, if I'm thankful to God for my children, then that will be visible in how I raise my children. That I will pray with my children. I will teach them to pray. That I will spend time in the Bible with my children. That will bring my children to the church. That will teach my children the ways of the Lord. If I am thankful for my children, that will be seen in how I raise my children. 
And I'm thankful for my wife that will be seen in my relationship to my wife. That I will build my relationship with my wife on the love and the kindness of Jesus Christ. That if I'm thankful to God for her, then that will be seen in my marriage relationship. And I'm thankful to God for the material blessings he has given me. For a house to live in and clothes to wear and more than enough food to eat. And that will be seen in how I use my material blessings. I personally have often supported the practice of tithing, of giving 10% of whatever we earn back to God. Not as a hard and fast rule, but as a good guideline for life. That if we are thankful for the very rich blessings that God has given us, they will be seen by making Jesus Christ the Lord of our finances. If I'm thankful to God for my salvation, if I'm thankful to the God of heaven who has sent his son to die for me, then that will be seen in my life. I will make worship a central part of my life. I will spend my time in praise and prayer and getting to know God. If I am thankful for that salvation, then it will be a thankfulness of actions, not just of words. In Haggai's day, the people said they were thankful. They didn't live like thankful people. In our day, that can still happen to us. We have a God who calls us to thankfulness. But it's not just a thankfulness of words, it's a thankfulness of actions. Anyone can say they are grateful to God. But just words are not going to counter the anxiety of this world. A thankfulness of actions will counter that anxiety. It will bring us peace. This is Thanksgiving weekend. This is a time to remember and give thanks to God. We have a God who calls us to more than just saying thanks, but to living thanks. In a moment, we're going to stand for our invitation. And as we stand to sing, if... You realize that you haven't lived thankfulness? That anxiety has overridden the thankfulness in your life, and you desire a counter there. You desire a life of thankfulness that counters the worry and the anxiety of this life. You have an opportunity. If you need to make your own commitment to the Lord, if you need to commit to a life of thankfulness by action, you have a chance right now. Ask you. Stand with me for our imitation hymn, which is number 145. I'll come all you think, and we will sing all the verses. Mm -hmm.